This is your chance. For your burning questions, please come up to the microphone and ask all your burning questions and please identify yourself. This is not a shy audience, so I'm going to help you kickstart if you're not going to go there, or else I'm going to suggest that you go to the podium and ask questions. I can do that as well. So um, I think obviously we wanted to highlight some of the investigative initiative studies we are doing, and I think what we are, I'm, I'm struggling with sometimes is there's so much data to learn, as you saw even within two cases where we have a responder, non-responder clinically, there's a whole sort of wealth of data behind the scenes that we have generated in terms of the, the genomics and the immunological phenotype. I guess I, I'm gonna ask Mario, because you're obviously an expert in this area, how do we put it together? On a global scale, obviously, we talked about a TCGA for immunotherapy, but even clinically, we struggle with weekly meetings, group meetings where we're going to share the data and learn. But obviously, it's tough to learn from you know, cases um, and, and trying to really put it together. Is there a, a way that you would see on, a, on an institutional level that we can actually learn better and, and be more able to pick up points here and there? <laughs> No, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I knew, I would have already done that at my institution. I, I, the, the, um, um, but but I but I love the trial that's being done because I I think even looking at ten patients in in a very intense way, you you could figure out at least uh, a few of the major mechanisms of resistance. I mean, um, in, in this patient in particular, you saw an increase in T cells, but there are other patients that you biopsy afterwards that have no T cells at all in the tumor microenvironment. And what the biology of that is, I don't understand. So um, I don't know how to do it in a big way, but, but I think this kind of a trial would, would, would lead to some answers at least. Um, please go up to the microphone, otherwise we can't hear you. And please introduce yourself, Rashida. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I'm Rashida Haq. I'm a medical <laughs> oncologist at St. Mike's. Uh, my question is to Anna. Uh, your second case, what, I just missed that. Was that, he seems like he had a lot of disease. What was his performance status? And to me, it didn't seem like there was a definite progression. Um, was that a pseudo progression or because um, I think Derek presented that data was very interesting to see that the CD8 um, in T cells improved. So I would like to know more about that case. Why is, what was the difference? Thank you. So uh, clinically it was, uh, you're right, uh, there's a uh, bulky disease uh, when he was enrolled in the study. Um, clinically, uh, it was uh, quite well. Uh, um, a man of 43 years old with no major uh, comorbidities. And uh, uh, yes, what we did see is that initially, um, we thought there was some sort of uh, uh, progression. That's why uh, we did an early scan at just after the second infusion. And we, we did see uh, some increase in target lesion, but overall there was a, a stable disease. So he carried on, um, and at the end he, had, he did have a, a true uh, uh, progression um, with uh, um, significant increase in, uh, in uh, tumor burnings. I think also in, in that particular case, it's not a tumor that really Correct. responds very much to conventional therapy. Yeah. So what we also see could be just his natural disease History. growth, right? Yeah. So, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Gronio Kane. I'm a fellow at Princess Margaret. Uh, I wondered if I could ask two questions. One to Dr. Schnoll. Um, so we talked a bit about kind of hot tumors and cold tumors and how we might ignite some of the cold tumors. Um, do you think there's a role for hypofractionated uh, radiation therapy in those cold tumors or to increase the response perhaps in uh, some of the more inflamed tumors? And secondly, the, the INSPIRE protocol is uh, quite amazing. Like um, when you're trying to decide on biomarkers, uh, there's genomics and there's immunophenotyping, like how do you kind of um, uh, rank these in order? And uh, do you uh, kind of do some work on T-cell receptor sequencing as well, and how does that add to your immunophenotyping work, maybe with Derek? So, Mario, the first question for you, in terms of cold tumors with uh, radiation. Yeah, I, I do think 
uh, that, that, I mean, it, radiation is known to be a sting agonist also. It, it's, Tom Gersk has reported that, or at least has, has talked about that. And um, certainly when we've combined um, radiation therapy, I don't know about hyperfractionation, but radiation therapy in general with anti type 4 we've seen great local responses, better than we would have expected with uh, either agent alone. We, we, we have not seen um, a lot of systemic uh, we haven't seen the abscopal effect. We haven't seen systemic spread of those responses, but maybe we're looking in the wrong set of tumors. But I still think it's an interesting investigational approach, and I do think radiation does disrupt the tumor microenvironment and does increase, does make some tumors hot, no question. Do you think then maybe there's certain, uh, I don't know how many radiation oncologists are in the audience, the, the timing and the fractionation probably makes a difference in terms of the abscopal effect. It, it does, but it's going to be really hard to sort that out in the clinic because, you, you know, to do that trial to figure out what the right fractionation actual dose uh, and to have a hom homogeneous group of patients to study that is, is really hard. Is this something we can model preclinically, you think, or, or even that is still difficult? I, <laughs> it's another very hard question. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be... Uh, I, I don't know how faithfully the mouse tumors, you know, mimic the human situation. So um, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. For the second question, I think maybe we should also put Pam on the spot because I think Grania's question is, how do you look at all the biomarkers when the world's your oyster here, in terms of an uh, oyster? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that you can pick the right biomarkers to look at in INSPIRE, a, a study such as INSPIRE. So I presume, Derek, you would want to take a first step and also maybe Pam? Sure. So I can tell you what we did, at least for INSPIRE. It was really just Pam, David Brooks, Tracy McGaha, Lynn, Mark, Trevor, sitting in a room really just brainstorming what should we look at, um, and me scrambling to write things down. <laughs> um, yeah. And it hasn't obviously been difficult to get blood draw, for example, for all of your for biomarkers from your Inspire patients. Everyone's been able to give. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, all the bloods have worked. And the tumors, initially it was difficult, um, but that's improving. Um, and especially moving it from the third cycle. So initially it was a third cycle, and it's been pushed up to a second cycle biopsy, um, just because some of the patients were coming off study um, before we get that tissue. So. My turn. <laughs> um, so uh, I think one of your questions was, are we looking at TCR repertoire as well? So Trevor, I don't know if Trevor's here. Um, but yes, he's, they've developed. Do you want to comment, Trevor? OK, so <laughs> he's developed different ways to do the TCR sequencing as well as um, B cell reception. Can you explain a little bit to the audience about what TCR, TCR sequencing means and does, just so people understand? Uh, sure. So we're interested in unique arrangements of BDJ cassettes within both the T cell and immunoglobulin loci. And we've developed a hybrid capture based method that will let us pull down specifically those regions in highly fragmented DNA. So our aspiration is to go to exactly where, I forget where you've gone, but basically to go towards monitoring those sequences in circulating tumor DNA. Uh, but for Inspire, we're just trying to look at that specifically in the tumor and then genotype those specifically in the but, blood. But in lay terms, what we're trying, you're trying to do is to see whether you can pull out the clones of T cells with specific <coughs> TCRs that potentially could be the ones recognizing the antigen and trafficking to the tumor? Yes, exactly. And answer this question of is it polyclonal or oligoclonal? Is it five clones? Are there millions of clones? What does that look like in the tumor before treatment and then after immunotherapy? <laughs> And do we see expansion of specific T cell populations over time? Do you want to explain? That's great. Any, any further addition to the biomarkers? How, how do you decide on the large list of tests to look at? And then how do you change as the environment changes? When, for example, we hear more from the literature about resistance to PD1, PDL1, do we, do we evolve to, to incorporate additional markers, for example? So I can't add any answers, but I can add some thoughts to that, because I think that's all the kinds of questions we're asking. So the importance of understanding the TCR repertoire or the B-cell repertoire is, is, as was said, it's, I think it's important to know if you've got a polyclonal or a monoclonal response. And in that way, we can think about how many antigens are we talking about in terms of a responding T-cell population. But what we also, and so in order to focus that a little bit more carefully in, um, in fact, in the biopsy situation in, the, in these 
in this case, we actually don't have enough cells to ask this question properly. So we're, we're going to scratch the surface and just look at repertoire. But I think the real question that needs to be asked is take the, the PD-1 positive, the activated cells that are PD-1 positive, 4-1-BB positive, in any baseline tumor and ask the question, do people normally mount an oligoclonal response against the tumor or is it monoclonal? How many antigens are we talking about? And the more oligoclonal response you get, it would infer that there's a really oligoclonal uh, uh, response against many, many antigens. So I think we really need to understand the basics of that. So Trevor and I were talking yesterday and what we really need to do is also look look at uh, baseline tumor response and look at the repertoire, and we're going to get there. And we're, we were talking in particular also for other cancers, such as ovarian cancer, we, we know we have a lot of B cell infiltration. We need to understand what that is and what they're doing there. And so by looking at the repertoire for B cells, which we were talking about yesterday, we'll, we'll have a better insight into what's really going on in the tumor microenvironment. But the other answer is, is you know, until we understand the baseline tumor, which is what Mary and I were talking about, it's really going to be hard to say this is the right combination therapy for any given patient. And, and we really have to do the deep dive in the baseline tumor before we can do any of the predictive studies for all the, the markers that Phil was talking about. You know, we can't just magically combine everything under the sun and have a response. We really need to know what's happening. Mary? Yeah, and you know, Pam, uh, we, I, one of the things that we've uh, some of the work that R. Melman did has really caused me, you know, the, the whole issue of how PD-1 works and where the phosphatases act and they are acting on CD28 instead of the TCR signal has started, it's, it caused me to start thinking that perhaps it's, it's not just PD-1 cells, it's different subset of cells that may respond to PD-1 blockade, so maybe a CD28 positive cells are responding and we're not looking at that specific subset. And I'm even concerned that depending on what signal you give, different subsets of cells expand in vivo. So. Um, one thing that we're, we're going to do, hopefully, is when we take the, the, uh, the initial cells, we're going to start, uh, we're going to look at TCRs before and after expansion, to the, t the TCR repertoire, to see whether there are some clones that actually don't expand. If there are some clones that don't expand, what signals we might need to give to the non-expanding clones to make those, because those, that may be important and it might lead to different approaches in the clinic. So I don't know what you thought about, about that. The, the, um, my hesitation would be the non-expanding clones. It, it depends on whether uh, PD-1 and 4-1-BB is expressed on them. I think, that as, as you highlighted with the Rosenberg paper, those are the antigen-specific, the responding ones. So there's going to be a lot of uh, bystander infiltration of guys that are just there because yeah. the party's there. So that means the chemokines yeah. told them all to go there. <laughs> yeah. well, well, we're going to actually separate out the yeah. PD-1 positive cells and then ask the question in the PD-1 positive population whether, you know, what the TCR repertoire is before expansion and after expansion and to see if that changes, but only in the PD-1 positive yeah. cell yeah. population. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Pam. Go ahead. Um, Rebecca Wong, radiation oncologist. Thank goodness like you're in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, responding to your call for radiation oncologist. Um, so a, a comment and a question, um, certainly uh, um, about the dose uh, issue in combination immunotherapy uh, in the radiation oncology community, we're really very interested in those questions, um, whether small doses, the doses that we use for st in standard fractionation can be like an inoculation type of concept, uh, using it once a month, uh, uh, or hyperfractionation uh, um, where you're using uh, sixth grade 8 gray, 12 gray, um, and whether it's one fraction or a sequence of fraction um, would have a better uh, effect in uh, altering the immune uh, environment in combination with uh, immunotherapy agents. I think um, there are uh, trials that are uh, being designed and uh, rolled out uh, to address those questions. I think some initial thinking experience from animal experiments is uh, suggesting that perhaps uh, the eight um, gray type of dose is uh, um, appropriate and, and doesn't need to be a high ablative dose um, to get the effect that we're looking for. A question that I would like to ask is in, uh, looking at the uh, pseudoprogression uh, patients. Um, would you hypothesize that it's a delay response or there's an inflammatory response that would make the tumor look bigger? What do you think is happening in those pseudoprogression? You know, we've had this discussion at multiple meetings. We don't know. I mean, in some cases, I think it's true pseudoprogression, that it's just inflammation. 
the cells were there, they, the, the reason why we're now seeing them on the scan is that they're now developed infiltration, then the, the tumor goes away, the, infl the inflammatory response goes away, and then it goes away. But, but I, I think in some patients, there really is a late response. It takes, those tumors are, it's true progression, and then it takes time for the T cell response to get into the tumor microenvironment and then, uh, and then make that tumor go away. I, so I, I think both cases occur in, in the clinic. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Morganson. I'm a staff oncologist at SickKids. Can I just ask about tumor heterogeneity? Because we've been talking about not having much information about the baseline normal tumor situation in terms of immune infiltrate. And it just strikes me that there's, is there a potential risk in terms of trying to compare a tumor biopsy before treatment and after tumor, uh, after treatment, that actually a difference you see there might be related to tumor heterogeneity in the first place rather than a result of treatment effects? especially in terms of immune infiltration, which might be related to the tumor anatomy and uh, blood vessels and that sort of thing. Has, has that been looked at? You all can answer this. <laughs> I know at least for us, like we did one study just to see if the biopsies were actually representative of the whole tumor. So one thing that we did is from like debulking uh, procedures. We would take the whole tumor, I would just take like sort of fake core biopsies from the tumor and then digest the biopsies and the whole tumor in parallel, and then look at the infiltrating immune cells in both, and they match up very nicely. Um, so I, I think I would be reasonably confident to say that the biopsies are representative. The one risk, I think, would be with the IHC core, because it's just one, one punch. So it could, I guess, be more susceptible to bias, depending where that punch happens. But I think the flow, by pooling three cores, we're, we're getting a good average of the tumor. I mean, the only thing we try and do, we try and biopsy the same lesion. Uh, so that's sort of something we try to be diligent about as well. But of course, it's, it's not perfect. So I have a question for Phil. And we talked about combinations. And you know, we, we see all kinds of different designs. People who have monotherapy that come off and then go you know, different sort of arms that look at combination or those that cross over to combination. How do you see as sort of the most efficient way to look at the 800 plus and more combinations to come. Is there a way to be more adaptive? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, I think the challenge is you're talking about small studies with different designs, with different mixes of patients, some of which have been exposed to PD-1, others haven't. There may be some time lag in behind. I think from an efficiency point of view, you know, having, particularly with drugs where you don't expect a lot in terms of additional toxicity, it makes a lot of sense to sort of escalate the monotherapy and then have the combination soon behind that. I think you learn a lot, you know, sometimes from patients who roll over on progression from monotherapy to combination in terms of understanding the effect. But getting tissue is critical, really, in order to try and understand what the immune response is. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty is we deal with patients who are sick. Sometimes it's just not feasible to roll them over because they're, they're not well enough uh, in this situation. Mary, you want to add to that? I, I just think we have to start doing these trials in patients who are uh, progressing on frontline therapy because if, if you go up front, it's very hard to read the signal. The PD-1 has enough of a signal that, that you have to almost have to do a randomized trial or see a huge signal in order to know that you're doing something. But if you start going into the refractory setting where you, the response rate is, is ex these are people that are progressing on therapy or um, not people who've responded and then, and then progress later, but people who are progressing on therapy are clearly resistant. Um, if you see a signal in that group, even a very low signal tells you that you've identified uh, an, an active uh, mechanism of resistance or if you address an active mechanism of resistance, and then doing pre and post treatment biopsies in that setting might really tell you what's going on. So I'm a big believer in doing it in the refractory setting. Now. So do, do you think the field's going into, you know, in genomics, for example, we find that we need to sort of go into smaller and smaller subsets for the obvious reason that people have very rare variants in some cases. In the field of immunotherapy, do we think this is more likely going to be the big trial, big data, the randomization, or do you think we're going to be going into the more, trying to find the small subsets and really go in with the best combination and personalize the immune therapy for those patients? I know there are no answers, but, you know, I have to ask questions. <laughs> not, not yet, not unless you, um um, I mean, I'm not even sure that if you have a high IDO expressing tumor that that's the right tumor to use IDO plus PD-1, for example. I, I just don't know. So uh, I think we're at the point where we, 
we, we have to do the biopsies, be agnostic as to whether it works or not, and then retroactively go, retrospectively go back and see whether any subgroup responds. Then when we get really good at it, then you can start subdividing it. But at the moment, I don't think the biomarkers are that good, unless somebody has information that, that I don't. Anna, Phil, as a clinician, where do you think? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. I think we've learned a lot already as a field in a short period of time from patients and tumor types we didn't think would respond that have responded. So it's really a situation where I think we're going to learn so much from reverse translation, sort of treating patients with these agents that are ready in the clinic that we have better experience in managing, and really going deep and collecting good samples and understanding the science behind it. And strong preclinical uh, data. Um, are also very important. We are learning and hopefully uh, getting our results with, with the metagor study, uh, with the science that has been uh, developed um, by Daniel and his team. I think that will help. We haven't spoken about that. Okay. Now, I know there are a lot of pharmaceutical um, colleagues in the audience, and I know you guys are not shy, so I'm going to encourage you guys to go up to the microphone. I think from our point of view, we wanted to hear some of the challenges in the pharmaceutical business, too, in terms of how to do some of these combination studies. What do you see as a hurdle in terms of, you know, getting these studies done, finding the right patients? I'm going to put names on the, on, I'm going to look at right at Marbrook, right there, <laughs> and put them at the, uh, at the podium. <laughs> as a disadvantage of sitting in the front. Uh, Marbrook Algeri from Berger Ingelheim. Um, we are now starting the immunotherapy a little bit later than the other companies, but uh, one of the biggest challenges is actually the competition. Uh, there's not a whole lot of patients that qualify for the criteria we want to see in clinical trials. So, uh, so far, the regulators have approved the checkpoint inhibitors in certain tumor types. Do you see us moving away from tumor types? and in the future looking at patients based on characteristics and treating, uh, having indications across all tumor types if the patient has certain characteristics. So the immune basket question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure either. The, uh, <laughs> I haven't had a single positive response this morning. That's um, okay, the feels young, uh, sort of. <laughs> but I'm old, so. <laughs> the, uh, um, um, you know, for example, PDL1 means something different in different tumors. You know, it, at, at least if you believe the assays, PDL1 is predictive to some degree in lung cancer, but not so much in renal cancer or in melanoma, or at least not highly predictive. So, uh, um, it's uh, it, maybe we'll get to the point where biomarkers are everything. But at the moment, uh, disease con contexture really does add to the information, or disease adds to the information. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, there's enough challenges just getting PDL1 one right, uh, understanding what it means in different tumor types. It's pretty clear that, you know, the, the biggest thing that, that reflects right now what we know in terms of who's going to respond and who isn't is what kind of cancer they have. Any additional questions? Bob, you're not shy. Come up to the podium. Bob Kerbel. <laughs> I know I'm a, a frightening chair. I put people on the, on the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, with respect to, you know, an approach possibly to predict what combinations might be uh, better than others, I think a major problem and something that I've been studying mainly in the context of anti-angiogenic drugs for over 15 years is improving preclinical models. So, you know, there's been a trend, obviously, as you well know, Lillian and others, where, you know, results in most preclinical models, and that's true whether it's PDXs or genetically engineered mouse models or transplants, you know, often have a high uh, negative correlation. Work well in mice, bombs in the clinic are much less effective. So, you know, there are approaches, I think, that at least we have taken to improve the predictability of, say, an anti-angiogenic therapy, a VEGF-targeting therapy. For example, one is just modeling the treatment of metastatic disease, either adjuvant or metastatic therapy, rather than using the time-honored approach of just treating a, a primary tumor. Now, there are other approaches that could be taken. That's just one. But if there are 800 combinations being tested now, it seems to me that's just throwing darts in many cases, and we have to go back earlier, I think, at the preclinical level and determine how best we can 
improve some of these preclinical models, not just in mice, so that you have a better chance of picking something that actually might be effective. The challenge, obviously, is it's tough to come up with reliable, reflective immune models that are usable or user-friendly. You have to start somewhere and generate a database. And right now, I think that that's not being done to the extent that it ought to be. Yeah, I agree. Going back to the question of really pulling the data together, and I think the, well, the Moonshot program, if it still exists, has some aspirations to, to do so. so. Well, there are no further questions. I think we had a great morning, lots of uh, 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 interest, and uh, I encourage you to drink more coffee so that you're ready for the second session, which is even more exciting.